Alright, this is just going to be a brief tutorial for the military aspect of this game. You don't really have to know anything about this stuff, but inevitably when you lose a battle and you think to yourself, how did I lose that? What happened? This is going to help you out. Alright, you might have seen all these stats here. The most obvious is your force limit. You can only go up to 35. You should know that, you know, if you've ever played the game, it's pretty obvious. Uh, the first up is Army Tradition. Um, not listed anywhere that I know of. Oh, okay, it does say here. The ability of your general depends on your Army Tradition. The more Army Tradition you have, the better your general will be. At 100 Army Tradition, you rank a pretty good chance of at least getting a 4-4 general without any other modifiers. The other modifiers to... Uh, your general will pretty much come from either your national ideas or things like offensive ideas as land leader shock, land leader fire, defensive as land leader maneuver. There are um, some policies you can see. I think expansion should have a couple. Yeah, right at the top. Ec uh, expansion quality is uh, yearly army tradition, land leader fire. And there should be. It's odd. Is it in Humanist? Yeah, it is in Humanist. So Humanist quality is a uh, yearly army tradition land leader shock. So those are good ways to get good generals. Going into the uh, ideas thing from earlier, I guess this is more advanced. Looking at what you're trying to do is uh, if you're trying to roll up perfect generals, and for example, Humanist quality is a good way to go. Because you're going to get... Uh, uh, land leader shock, yearly army tradition, uh, and quality itself has plus one yearly army tradition. Um, the other thing about yearly army tradition is you gain one per month if you have a large amount of fully maintained fords. Or I shouldn't say one per month, you gain plus one yearly. Now, uh, I'm not gonna go into the math, but this is pretty basic. If you have plus one yearly army tradition because it decays 5% per year, you will be at 20 minimum. If you have plus two yearly army tradition, you will be at 40 minimum. If you have plus 2.5, you'll be at 50 minimum. So by having a large amount of fully maintained forts, quality ideas, and the humanist uh, quality policy, you will have no less than 50 army tradition. That, uh... It's a pretty good number for rolling up good generals, in addition to the plus one land leader shock. Now, the other thing is, uh, early arm, or army tradition gets you a small amount of morale. I think it goes, I think it goes up to 15% at 100. Uh, you also get manpower recovery speed up to 10%. You get recover army morale speed up to 10%. And you get siege ability up to like 5%. Having 100 uh, army tradition is pretty potent. You gain army tradition by fighting battles. The better your opponents are, the more army tradition you'll get. Uh, including if you were to fight France with, say, for example, I don't know, a small country like Nassau, you would gain a flabbergastingly large amount of army tradition. That's one of this game's comeback mechanics. The game has a large amount of hidden comeback mechanics that help you uh, not lose the game immediately. They're not all obvious and apparent, but they're there. So that's what Army Tradition does. This is uh, morale. Now, what morale does is interesting. Now, I don't know if this has changed, but from what I can tell is the more morale... Well... This changes patch to patch, so don't take my word on it. But your morale is effectively how much morale your individual units have before they retreat. Now, all your units contribute to your army's morale. Now, what that means is that uh, if I have this light infantry on the front line, and he fights and he fights and he fights, he might retreat at... 500 troops left now the army won't retreat but that unit will not participate in the battle anymore when your army morale runs out which is this bar here all your units retreat that means having a high morale drastically improves you in combat since your units might fight much farther into a battle if for example somebody is high uh offensive capabilities through discipline but i have high army morale through things like elan 
and defensive ideas, he might kill far more of my troops, but I'll win the battle. In addition, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but I'm trying to make this a little bit more complicated so you can devise tactics. This is what uh, I don't know about, but I'm fairly certain that giving your armies more morale increases the morale damage they deal. Which means that, uh, at the very least, I know things like, you'll see here, infantry combat. Infantry combat ability increases the, um, physical damage, like the army damage they deal, like the casualties they deal, in addition to the morale damage they deal. So 10% infantry combat ability, especially if you're, uh, Brandenburg with another 20%, or Sweden with another 20%, or Poland with another 15%, uh, especially if you get a policy, there's a policy for another 20% infantry combat. You can start uh, making people take huge amounts of casualties and then retreat with like, potentially, if you seriously max it early game before other people increase their morale, you can start making people retreat with like 700 troops left. Which means eventually what's going to happen is they won't have enough armies to fill the front line anymore. Uh, this is the combat with. At Tech 1, you can have 5 units on the front line. And then I think... Oh, it's plus five, and then I think the base might be five. It's something like that. Either way, you might get to the point where you have so many units retreating that even though you have 20,000 troops left, only, you know, 5,000 of you are even fighting on the front line anymore. You know, which means that you're fighting 10,000 with 5,000, drastically increasing your casualties. Morale stacking um, is a reasonable way to make your army very effective. Uh... Nations like the Hansa, who can, you know, let me just tag over here. The Hansa have a unique mechanic for merchant republics. When they have the uh, aristocrats in power, they get 5% more morale armies. That got nerfed pretty hard. Uh, the, and the Hansa have a unique idea group. Uh, all merchant republics, I mean, plutocratic ideas, which gives them another morale. So if you go Hansa, go aristocratic faction, get plutocratic, get defensive, and then uh, try to stack more morale through discipline or other ways, you can seriously start winning battles despite taking large amounts of casualties. But let's go to, for example, Brandenburg here. Now, Brandenburg is the ultimate in everything. When it comes to military ideas, they are the best. They have yearly army tradition, they reduce their decay, they get 20% morale, they get 20% infantry combat, they get bonus manpower by 25%, uh, they get 7.5 discipline rather than the mere 5% discipline. Huge stuff for Brandenburg. Watch out for Brandenburg. If they get big, watch out for Brandenburg. The other country that has decent army ideas, really, uh, Sweden, again, Sweden's big, they get 20% uh, infantry combat and a land leader shock, and then additionally, um, through their events, they'll get another 5% morale there. Uh, in addition to all that, they get uh, not a big amount, but they do get 10% magical manpower and 20% recovery. I imposed it on accident. Uh, good stuff for Sweden. Very good army. Now, the other really big powerhouse is Poland. Watch out for Poland. Poland gets, uh, 33% cavalry combat. Uh, if the Winged Hussars come at you early game... Now, later in the game, cavalry become weaker and weaker as the game progress. So, they can't get Winged Hussars until late mid-game. No, no, late early game, I'll say. Late early game. But once they get it, watch out. Poland can build, uh... Typically, you only want two to four cavalry in your army because they're very expensive. You can see here, uh, you know, maintenance 0.41, maintenance of an infantry 0.2. Cavalry are hella expensive. And that's with Poland, who reduces their cavalry cost by 20%. So, you know, you'll start to see cavalry are not very effective. If you're hella rich and you have literally nothing to do with your money early game, which would be absurd, there's always something to do with money, but say you do, then you can build more cavalry, otherwise 2 to 4. Now, what else does pull in? If you're looking at 33% cavalry combat, they get 10% infantry combat, 25% manpower, it goes better, they get 5% discipline, it gets better, they get 15% morale. Watch out for Poland. Very powerful. Now, the last country that you have to watch out for is France. Now, 
France doesn't have that good of stuff. They have more manpower, which is okay. They get 5% discipline, which is okay. You know, nothing really here, nothing really here. But they do get 20% morale of armies. Now, France is a rich country, which means they tend to get lots of cannons. You want as many cannons as you can up to 40% of your army. Uh, now, having less than that can be ideal because what can happen is if all your infantry die, then, um, well, then your cannons are going to get hit, and cannons take 50% more damage, but cannons uh, do damage from the back row, which means you're effectively doubling the amount of people who can fight in a battle by having large amounts of cannons. France's 20% of morale, in addition to having cannons, being very rich means that France will often storm through and just tear these weaker countries apart they can't even fight countries like austria now you might be wondering all right austria's heads for can i fight austria austria starts a decent 10 percent of morale but they only get three percent discipline three percent discipline ten percent of morale means if you're playing austria and you're fighting a country like poland late game you're gonna need like 1.3 to 1 odds you're gonna need about 30 percent more troops now, let's proceed. That's just generally looking over countries. Uh, that's morale. Go down. Tactics. You just get this from ranking up. You will never get tactics from anywhere else. Tactics only reduces the amount of damage you take on casualties. You can see here. Uh, as you tech up, you get more tactics. This is primarily done because, as you saw, countries will get more infantry combat. They'll get more discipline. They'll get uh, infantry combat here, they'll get discipline, artillery combat, cavalry combat, and through doing all this stuff, you might wonder, well, late game, don't you take more damage? You will take more damage as the game progresses. Um, the tactics you get uh, through getting new technology helps to stop me that. You can see you get 0.5 at 23 and 0.5 at 30. That's really done to stop late game mega bleed, but it just increases as the game progresses. Uh, Helps you stop, so don't worry about that. You will literally, you don't even have to pay attention to it. That's just technology. Defensiveness is, uh, as you see here, it just impacts each tick of a siege. The more defensiveness you have, the slower those ticks will work. Uh, you get it primarily from power projection, from uh, defensive ideas. I think stuff like that. <laughs> It's really not something you have to worry about. The main way to get it is through events that can happen that allow you to build up your forts. Don't really worry about it. Fort maintenance, siege ability is uh, effectively when it's not how much faster you get a tick, but what siege ability does is make each tick more potent. So defensiveness is good for defense, siege ability is good for offense. Siege ability can also mean that you won't roll. If you have a high siege ability, you won't do bad rolls like uh, disease breaks out, stuff like that. Naval tradition, naval morale. These uh, navies tend to not be very potent for lots of reasons, but now that's pretty much all there is to it. The best way to win is to stack discipline. That's the best way to win, obviously. Uh, so that's why a lot of people, that's why I recommend going economic quality, because economic quality have, you can see it right at the top of policy for an additional 5% discipline. 5% discipline for finishing the tree, 5% discipline for the policy, go offensive, get another 5% discipline. You can be a 15% discipline purely off ideas in only three idea groups. Now, that won't get you anything special, okay? Now that's the only drawback of doing that. Now... In multiplayer, at least, having the better army pretty much makes you better. You know? Adds... I, I, I mean, that's really all I can say. Having the better army pretty much makes you better. You pretty much want to focus your army ahead of anything else. Now, there are exceptions. I'm going to focus on new players. New players, just make your army really good. Otherwise, you'll run into bad situations. Now... You might be wondering, where are there exceptions? Why would I not want to focus on military ideas? I know this is a military tutorial, but not focusing on military is also a military decision. Now, 
when you fight a battle, uh, let me see if I can tag in his friends here. So, let's, uh, oh, I guess this is part of, you see the army maintenance is low? If I push that up, you'll see that, uh, I don't immediately get all my morale back. But let's go ahead, declare war on England, put this at five speed. It's auto saving, hold on. Alright, let's just wait for the French to send their army. I just want to fight a battle. Okay, they should be unloading an army at some point. A good way to defend against navies, by the way, is uh, you always leave boats taking a little bit of attrition with 50% morale. So if you're playing England, for example, if you're paying attention to where they're trying to land, uh, you can do some serious damage. Alright, I'm gonna, I guess, siege him and hope that he finally decides to drop a boat down. It's just a decision. I don't even know why I looked at that in this tutorial. Okay, uh, in the meantime, while I'm waiting for this to happen... Uh, why wouldn't you want to go military? Because there are uh, military decisions... Okay, let's pause this. Now you'll see right here, okay? This shows me my morale. This shows me my... Dis okay, this shows me my discipline. This shows me my morale. This shows me my tactics. This shows me... Oh, actually, this was theirs. Okay, and then on the other... So this is me, you can tell, because I'm France. Hi, I'm France. And then you can tell, because this is England. Hi, they're England. So right now, at the beginning of the game, we are evenly matched. What this will not account for is infantry combat, artillery combat, etc. So you can see, you can even like highlight and be like, okay, where is he getting his morale from? From technology, power projection, army tradition, prestige, okay. Uh, it'll also show me infantry, cavalry, and now you can see the battle line here, okay? So you can see that if you outnumber your opponent, you actually start to do free damage on them. See that? So this dude at the end who isn't actually being fought back against, he's just doing free damage. That's why you typically want to outnumber people. That also means, uh... Why having... Oh, I guess it's a 20 combat win. It also means why dealing morale damage, because not only will you wipe them, not only will you make... Because let's watch. See how my troops are treated? This is his troop, he's entering the battle now. So, if I make him retreat very quickly, let's say I was the one winning, I'm losing this battle obviously, but I was winning, he would be having to send in reinforcements from the top row, entering the bottom row. So having a high morale can mean you can disorient your opponent. Now, what is discipline? Let's look at that. Because you're wondering, why do I keep calling discipline the best at the game? You might be like, well, why 10% infantry combat? That seems better than 5% discipline. Okay. Discipline, 5% discipline gives you 5% more casualty damage on all units. 5% more morale damage on all units. Land, sea, all of them. 5% less casualties taken on all units. 5% less morale taken on all units. So even though you're thinking to yourself, 5%, that can't add up very quickly. It does add up, because you're doing 5% more damage in all morale in all casualties. You're taking 5% less damage in all morale, all casualties. That's why, you know, if you really, if you're like, if you are, I don't know, who would you be? Though? If you were Brandenburg, and you were like, okay, I got the best military ideas in the game, but I start off small. I need to make my army crazy, stupid, powerful very quickly. You could go quality, economic, offensive. But when would you not want to go a military idea? Let's go back to that. Humanist. Because... Here's what you might be wondering. You have manpower. Manpower is important. If you run out of manpower, you have to use mercenaries. Mercenaries are two and a half times as expensive. You will run out of money very, very quickly. Actually, let's do... Uh, I want to show you one maneuver here real quick. Okay. Now, you might be wondering... Okay, so I had to hire mercenaries. I had to because... 
I had to. I, I just ran out of troops. Okay. How do I get rid of my mercenaries? Well, this is actually pretty easy. Let's save here. Here's what you do. All mercenaries from this unit will be detached. Click this button. Now this means... You see how this attaches all units to merge it? You know it's eight. Now first off, you can see these. So let's say I wanted to personally... I was like, okay, I need to get rid of these mercenaries because they're old technology. Mercenaries will not update to new technology. They're old tech. I can make it that way. But so I was like, okay, I just need to get rid of all mercenaries and all my armies because I cannot afford mercenaries. Boom. Do it like that. They're gone now. It's a good idea to have one or two, you know, three to four mercenaries if you can afford it in your armies at all times, just to stemmy the flow, because if you take a lot of manpower damage, you might not have it in the next war. So you want to conserve your manpower. And that's why uh, quantity comes in. Quantity is a very effective way to go. Uh, the other idea, now this aristocratic, you're probably wondering why do I never suggest aristocratic? Aristocratic does a lot of things, but it doesn't do any of them particularly well. It gives you the best modifier for cavalry, but cavalry aren't very good. It gives you hostile core creation, but that doesn't actually help you until you've already lost. It gives you in from income from vassals, but only 10%, and income from vassals is very low. It gives you manpower, but it only gives you 25%. It gives you yearly army tradition decay, but a bonus army tradition is better than a decay reduction. Gives you a diplomat, but this is a military idea, why do I want another diplomat? Gives you cost of reducing war exhaustion reduction, which is very good, actually. But actually not as good as the diplomatic cost of reducing war exhaustion. Gives you military technology cost reduction, but 10% only on military techs. Versus innovative gives you 5% on all techs. Gives you a leader without upkeep, which is good. But, you know, truly for most people, you're only going to be running around with two main armies most of the game. And you can easily get to two main, uh, two military commanders simply by becoming an empire. Now, obviously, you're not going to become an empire uh, for a long time. But, uh, end result, let's say, you know, well, now that you're done looking at manpower, why would you want to not go on military? Do? Humanist. Humanist reduces your unrest, reduces in years of separatism, reduces, uh, increases tolerance of heretics, tolerance of heathens, increases accepted culture threshold. Now what does that mean? That means you will get far less rebellions and almost no rebellions if you're humanist. Fighting rebellions takes manpower. That's why humanist is actually not like an ultra popular idea, but that's why humanist quality is a reasonably popular way to go. Reasonably. It's not going to be as powerful as uh, economic quality, but humanist quality saves you a lot of manpower. Saving manpower means less mercenaries. Now, the obvious other side is economic gives you more tax, uh, reduces your build costs, reduces your interest on your, ta or in your uh, loans, Reduces your autonomy monthly, increases your production, reduces your land maintenance modifier. So economic saves you and gains you a lot of money. Whereas humanist just reduces your manpower drain. Economic will allow you to buy those mercenaries so you don't have to use all your manpower. Conserving your manpower is how you win wars. Draining your opponent... Now, there are two ways to win wars, really. The first is you just beat the shit out of his army, siege all his territory, and, well, he can't fight back even though he has manpower. The second way is you just slowly drain them via manpower. Now, the obvious downside is, hey, let's say I manage my manpower a lot better, okay? And I went quantity, and I went aristocratic, and I got policies, which give me bonus manpower recovery... Uh, for example, here we go, quantity, uh, administrative, gives you manpower recovery speed. Let's say I did that, and I was like, I got the best, biggest armies. The more casualties you take, the more war exhaustion you take. The more war exhaustion you take, the closer you become to having to quit out of the war. Generally, winning wars, that's how you do it. You either beat them in battle, or you out-attrition them. And I don't mean attrition via, like, when you sit on a territory, you take attrition damage. What I'm talking about is attrition by you just deal more casualties, take less casualties. Alright, and that's pretty much it. Now, the last concept we're going to go over is forts. 
Attacking into mountains is suicide. You need effectively 3 to 1 odds to overcome a mountain, and you will take absurd casualties along the way. 30 people with a general on a mountain is pretty much good enough to stop anything from coming over unless they take ludicrous casualties. I've but if you are Brandenburg and you have good you know Brandenburg is the best military in the game, okay? You're Brandenburg, you have the best military in the game, you have, you know, economic quality offensive and you attack into mountains against a dude with literally no military ideas, you will only take one to one casualties. That's how bad it is. Oh, I should mount well, I'm not gonna get into this now. The Ottomans also have the potential to have the best army in the game. The Ottomans are potentially the best everything in the game. Watch out for the Ottomans. If you find yourself in a situation where the Ottomans have beaten the Mamluks and they've beaten the Timurids and they're expanding into Egypt and the Mamluks can't really stop them anymore and the Timurids can't really stop them anymore, the Timurids are over here, I just you can't see them on the map. If you're playing Poland or you're playing Lithuania, you're probably going to want to come down here and deal with the Ottomans at some point. Because at some point or another, they're going to go, you know, I really want to be in first place, and uh, I really want to kill you. And you're just going to find out that the Ottomans cannot be stopped anymore because you didn't stop them early. And, you know, just watch out for the Ottomans. Uh, what was I going to say, though? So, you're looking at forts. Now, forts will guard that terrain and every area around it. You cannot move past a fort. So, like, if I entered Daphne, I could go from, for example, uh, Dauphine to here to back out of the fort, right? So, this fort didn't exist. Imagine this fort didn't exist. And there was a fort here. I could go from here to here to here. But I would not be able to go from here to here to here because I, I can't move within two tiles of fort zone of control. So, a fort on this territory would pretty much curb stomp my ability, or my opponent's ability to move past me. You know, they would have to go up to here or here. Now, since this is a mountain, and I put an army here, let's say I put this army on the mountain to defend it, this is a good location to stop a surprise attack. Always be wary about surprise attacks. If you're playing Spain, put a fort here, put a fort here, and sit there, because that's a mountain, that's a mountain. You will effectively stop France's ability to attack you. France will not be able to attack you anymore if you have a fort here and a fort here. It just, you can't move past a mountain. He could maybe, if you've got 30,000 there, he could bring in 100,000 Frenchmen and attack. His casualties will be atro atrocious. He'll overwhelm you. Eventually, yeah, you know, 100,000 will overwhelm 30,000, but he's going to take pretty big losses, and if you reinforce it, you might win the war in one battle, because he'll take you know, 50,000 casualties in one battle. Another way, if you're Hungary, uh, these are actually grasslands, grassland. okay, apparently I know nothing about Hungarian terrain. Um, here's another good one, uh, you can see the Ottomans right here, the Ottomans will conquer Constantinople, so don't worry about that. If you put a fleet here, you stop their ability to move past this pass, see those dotted lines, you can move through those. If I put a fleet, you'd say, Let's say I'm Lithuania, and I notice, oh, the Ottomans are kicking the shit out of the Mamluks, and I have a big navy. Lithuania wouldn't have a big navy, but let's say hypothetically I did. I move my navy right here, and then I move my army to start sieging his top territories. The Ottoman player is like, oh shit, so he moves his army, and then he realizes, oh, I can't actually move past the pass. So he would have to get military access here, and here, and here, and here, to finally move up to Lithuania, at which point you've probably sieged down all his top territories in his capital, which would then be Constantinople, and the war is pretty much won already. That's a good location to do stuff on. So, that's pretty much an introduction to combat. Uh, now, you might be warning hills. Hills are as... Hills are bad to attack into, yes. Um, not as bad as mountains. Mountains can be suicide. Hills are bad. You'll want... At a mountain, you'll want comfortably 3 to 1 odds. And I'm not saying that lightly. Comfortably, you'll want 3 to 1 odds. And the issue with attacking into a mountain is if, let's say I attack here. I'd say, oh, he's only got 30,000. So I bring all 100,000 freshmen and I attack it. If he had another army down here, he could bring that army up, defend the mountain. And now instead of attacking 30,000 with 100,000, now I'm attacking 60,000 with 100,000. And that will hurt me badly. I might even win the battle still, but my casualties might lose a war in one blow. Hills are bad. 
you can overcome hills and not like mountains, but they're bad. You you don't want to attack. If, I, if he's got 30,000 on a hill, don't bring 50,000 in and be like, this will work. You might win the battle with 50,000 to 30,000, but once again, your casualties will be bad. Uh, woods, which pretty much all of North Germany is woods. Yeah, all of that's woods. Apparently Germany was nothing but a big pile of woods. Woods are bad. They give a 20% bonus to the defender, I think. So you only need a 20%. So like, you could beat 30,000 in woods with 36,000. But don't fight an equal fight in woods, okay? I actually think there's a... Uh... How do I do that? Hold up here. I'm trying to find... Uh, highlands are bad too, but they're not that bad. Why the shit can't... I thought you could see, like... Hmm. Okay, whatever. But, um... The last thing, marshes, I don't think give a bonus. Uh... Grasslands, farmlands are free. Highlands are bad, but I think they're not as bad as hills. Uh... Let's see, those are hills. Uh... Highlands are bad. Drylands are... Nothing. Uh, desert don't really mean much. Coastal desert doesn't mean much either. Uh, let me think here. Is there anything I missed? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Work with allies. Don't go in alone. Don't take bad battles. It only takes one or two bad battles for war to be over effectively because you can't mount no offense anymore. Manpower does not scale very well until the late game. Uh, early game, you might be able to lose two, even three battles and still be fine. Late game, you'll have like 60,000 manpower with a 124th limit. So you lose one battle and all your manpower will go into reinforcing your army. And then, you know, what do you do from there? You are you have to hire mercenaries. It's pretty much military. Uh, the last thing, let's talk about this. You can get... Is everybody gold? A million? Money a million? I don't know. Either way, um, there are... You can see there's an advisor with national manpower, an advisor with fort defense, an advisor with reinforced speed. There's another advisor with force limit. There's an advisor with uh, discipline. He's the best. The discipline advisor, the commandant. If you have him, you can seriously wreck some damage. Uh, you might be wondering, the reinforced speed advisor is very potent if you have a very, very rich country and you just want to throw your men into battles. Like the Hansa will do this. The Hansa will just throw their men into a battle, lose a battle, reinforce by mercenaries, throw them in, reinforce by mercenaries, throw them in. And you'll you'll be like, okay, you're losing like two men for every one I lose. And the Hansa's like, yes, and then I'm winning. You know? <laughs> so, um... You might be wondering, is money important? Again, yes, money is important. That's why economic quality is so potent. Uh, the other way to go... Uh, I mean, yeah, that, that, that's really a way to go. And you might be wondering, why do I not talk about diplomatic ideas? Well, let's talk about diplomatic ideas. Uh, they're shit. Uh, okay, diplomatic exploration quality has one good policy, but you might be noticing, uh, never go maritime, by the way, never go espionage, never go, never go trade, like, here's the thing about trade, is trade doesn't really make you that much more money. <laughs> you know? That's a big problem with diplomatic ideas, the only really good ones are diplomatic and influence. <laughs> And influence is good because it allows you to annex people for much lower cost. It allows you to expand quicker because of uh, aggressive expansion. It allows you to uh, annex quicker through diplomatic reputation. It allows you to ally the AI quicker. There won't be many AI, but, you know, uh, the other thing is vassals uh, tend to have shitty armies because the AI tends to have very poor uh, ideas. But... Influence does give you another diplomatic relation, does give you much more powerful vassals, they give you more money, they give you more force limit contribution. A vassal will increase your force limit, by the way. Um, it's like if I was playing, I don't know, let's say I'm playing Austria. I could, for example, make a vassal out of Salzburg, 
make them a march, a march is a type of vessel that just gets a bigger army, and then be like, okay, every war I fight, Salzburg will contribute troops to me in the war. They'll have probably 10,000, so good idea. The downside of vessels is they're very easy to break in peace. It's like if I was Poland, and I had even all of Lithuania under me, which is, you know, something that happened, in one war with 100% war score, I can make them release all of Lithuania. So, if you want, Vassal Swarming is a potent tactic, but it's also kind of a glass cannon, because Vassal Swarming will let you win wars, but on the other hand, uh, it's very easy to break a Vassal Swarmer in one lost war. So, for example, let's say I am, I don't know, Saxony, and I made a vassal here, 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 here. I had five vassals. And I made them all marches, and I gave them some land so they were, you know, powerful. Well, problem with vassals is they can rebel. Problem with vassals is you lose one war, and you can lose, you know, two or three vassals. And they're not very smart, and their armies will get upscaled by late game, because the AI has a tendency to only get, like, two military ideas, and none of them that... They'll get, like, aristocratic and defensive, and then you're like, that doesn't... okay. <laughs> so, uh, I think that wraps up military generally. Um, if you're new to the game, don't be afraid to lose a war. You can lose a war, you only lose, like, the top half of Poland, for example. Not the top, they only lose, like, the top third. You're still in the game, I guess is my point. So don't, you know, it's not the end of the world. Ask for help. Uh, people should be willing to help. For example, if I'm France and Castile is invading Morocco, I'll be like, Hey, Castile, looks like your army's not in Europe anymore. It looks like they're in Africa. So, do stuff like that. Mamluks, Venice, work together to fight the Ottomans. Uh, it looks like we have a Timurid player. You're kind of the dark horse. If you do good, you do good. If you fall into chaos, well, then Russia's just going to conquer you. Lithuania and Muscovy are going to have giant cataclysmic wars. Choose a side. I don't think we have a Polish player, but... We should get a Polish player. Poland's important, because their army is very potent. They're one of the few players who can put a stop to Brandenburg if Brandenburg gets out of hand. I'm not saying Brandenburg is unbeatable... Clearly, uh, as the game gets to, like, hyper late game, and you've got four military ideas, your national ideas matter a lot less. Like, when I have 20% morale of armies before anybody's completed it one military idea, that's crazy. You know, I'm just fighting 20% better. But when you have quality and offensive and defensive, you know, the difference between 0% morale and 20% morale, and, like, 40% morale and 60% morale, you know, those are big differences, you know? It's, the later one isn't so much a big deal. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, I think that's about it. Alright, so, uh, I know this went on for 40 minutes, but I guess it's a little bit too long, probably. <laughs> um... Yeah. And again, you guys should know how war score works. Um, the only last thing I can tell you is you can see uh, war exhaustion of your opponents. You can kind of see, you know, just how capable they are of continuing. Alright, that should be it then. Hope you guys do good.